All right. Hello everyone, I am Vashti, I'm from the Kingdom of Kalantir, and we're going to talk about clothing of the Abbasid Caliphate. And what we're looking at more than construction is kind of the social customs and the language around clothing, because I call everything I wear shalvar, kameez, kaba, pants, top, coat. So did my friend in 13th century Al-Andalus, so did my friend in 16th century Safavid, and I went, do we really all use the same language? And I started looking for names of clothing, and when I hit 26 names, I stopped and went, I don't have that many clothes. Even if I wear all the layers, even if I have a summer and a winter set, what's happening? <laughs> so I started looking for descriptions of the clothing and trying to figure out what am I missing? And I fell down a really big linguistic rabbit hole. So the big deal, the big major point, if you don't take anything else from this, Cultural context is everything in understanding clothing. Yes, we do sometimes use the same language across lots of cultures, across lots of time and space. Frequently, they don't mean the same thing. Um, and we'll get into some of the deep, some of the actual examples of that um, in just a bit. So when you're using a term, particularly the way we try to use things as shorthand in the SCA, that's not how they would have understood it, it within particular cultures. Each specific time and place had their own meanings for things. Um, clothing is also super informative. So understanding the customs around it makes a really big difference in how we are presenting ourselves. We've started to get away from just the big Middle Eastern umbrella. Persia is kind of that next big umbrella. There are so many different cultures that get grouped under Persia. Even when the Persians aren't the people in charge, it still gets called Persia. <laughs> we'll get into that too. Um, so the Abbasid Caliphate is Persia. It's an Arab Islamic controlled Persia. And fashion, we frequently think is a top down thing. And that that is accurate. The people in the palace dress certain ways, they can afford certain things, and then the next people down try to copy them. But who's in the palace in this era is really fascinating because the dynamics here are not what I was expecting to find because sometimes you have slaves setting the fashion trends. So it's a really interesting time period to study and, and I'm a bit obsessed with it. <laughs> so we're going to get into a little bit of setting the stage for the context for who, what, where, and when. I'll go over some cultural notes around clothing and we'll, then we'll dive into um, names of specific garments and their descriptions. And if I have to cut that part short so we have time for questions, um, I've made a PDF of this available so you guys will have the spelling of the names of the garments and the descriptions of them. So this is a map of the Abbasid Caliphate at its largest extent. And really what we're talking about with the Abbasid Caliphate is still called Persia. So all of this gets called part of Persia at some point. <laughs> When I talk about Persia, the core of it is Iran and Iraq modernly. Um, it's a cultural linguistic group that's based there, that's indigenous to that area. For ancient Persia, they went out and conquered a huge area. And then they lost a bunch of territory and other people came in and took over. Um, the Abbasid group is a Arab Islamic group that came up out of Saudi Arabia and took over. They're the second Arab Islamic group to take control of Persia. The first group was the Umayyads. And for the Umayyads, their capital was based in Damascus. A lot of their military came from the Mediterranean. They had a much more Spanish and Mediterranean flavor to their caliphate. When the Abbasids revolted, led by a guy named Abbas, that's where the name comes from, um, they gathered a lot of support because they were willing to open up some accesses to power and wealth to non-Arabs that the Umayyads had not been. So they gained a lot of popular support from non-Arab people. Um, and that's how their rebellion was able to succeed. And when they did that, they made their capital at Baghdad in Iraq. So Persia became the center of their empire. Um, and they brought Islam very directly to Persia in a big way. So that's kind of where and who and when. We're really talking 8th to 10th century for the information I've pulled for this class. 
the Abbasids took over um, and really secured Baghdad as their capital in 750. They technically last all the way until 1250. By, by mid 10th century, they're more of a puppet or a figurehead and not so directly in control anymore. <laughs> um, and, and that happens with multiple groups coming in and taking over parts of their territory and essentially saying, we'll enforce your religion, we'll split the taxes with you, you're gonna legitimize us as the governor of whatever. And then that group takes over kind of the Eastern half. They did actually hold Baghdad pretty much that entire time. Okay, so let's get into some cultural notes. So very early Arab Islamic dress, looking at Saudi Arabia, even before they ventured out into conquering other areas, you have a lot of cotton happening. For that climate, it makes a lot of sense, both in terms of agriculture and in terms of wearing it. And you have a lot of wrap garments. These are not sewn garments. These are literally big rectangles of fabric that you wrap around yourself in different ways. Um, that is a style that came to Persia with the Arab Islamic invasion. Rather than using that as your base layer, because Iran and Iraq have some high desert plateaus, they have mountains, it gets cold. <laughs> um, those wrap garments became outer garments. They became those extra layers um, to help keep you warm, but a lot of the names transitioned with them. Um, Persia and Central Asian, you have a lot of silk happening. Um, you have sewn garments and they, they refer to them as fitted garments. A lot of the times in the literature, this is not fitted the way we think about European garments. This is geometric construction all the way. It's also, especially the outer garments like the coats are going to be very loose by European and by modern standards. Um, you don't get inset sleeves, you don't get yokes. It, it's not that kind of fitted. You're putting this coat on over a minimum of four other layers, sometimes up to eight other layers. It's gonna be big on you. And for men going into battle, one of the things that happened a lot was that you would untie um, particularly with the crossed front coats, and we'll get into those, they would untie them and take their arms out of them in order to shoot their bow. So it had to be big enough you could do that on horseback while moving with a bunch of other stuff happening. <laughs> so the arms and the, the shoulder seams on them are a little oddly placed when we look at them by modern standards. But if you look at the function of what they were doing with those coats, it makes more sense. Um, we get a lot of embroidery happening on all layers of clothing. <laughs> One of the things I have not seen extants of, and I would, I'm working on getting more information for, is embroidered poetry on clothing. And this is a, a Eastern thing. This was not an indigenous thing in Persia. This came from several groups of slaves. Um, and slaves in the palace were living way above the standard of free citizens if you were not a domestic servant. So looking at the concubines mostly. Um, so they embroidered their clothing with silver and gold thread, particularly their sleeves and their headbands. Um, we get some undergarments that have embroidery on them of, of flowers and different things as well. But the embroidered poetry really fascinated me because if you're familiar with the concept of Taraz, that is an inscription on clothing. We're going to get into that in just a minute as well in a much more detailed way. <laughs> um, so uh, and that's something that was indigenous that has been going on for ages. And then this comes in from some of the slaves and it's, and it's specifically poetry and I don't have any more info than that on it so far. And that's driving me nuts because I wanna know what, <clears throat> what style of poetry, if this was a specific type of court poetry that was favorable for this or was it just whatever they liked? What language were they doing this in? Um, so there's, there's a whole fascinating history with inscribed clothing that happens. And this is one version of it that's not indigenous to the area that was happening at the same time. So I find it really fascinating as an option. Um, you see this happening in some other places as well. Um, this definitely happens in Umayyad controlled Spain. There's a lady there who I absolutely love 
who embroiders something on one of her garments that basically says something along the lines of, I am a child of God, I'll do what I want and I'll kiss who I want to. And it was like, oh, that's not the attitude I was expecting to find there at all. So that is outside of the Abbasid Caliphate, but you get a lot of inscription happening and it becomes very personal and you see people's attitudes that way. Um, major influences, again, that top down thing that's happening is absolutely happening here. People in the palace are setting the fashion. And most of the time that is the Caliph and that is his concubines. Um, those are enslaved women, but there's this thing in Islam where you can't enslave other Muslims. So who are these slaves? They are from literally everywhere else. Um, you do probably have some enslaved Persians and Arabs who are not Muslim, but you have Greeks, you have Slavs, you have some Africans, you have people from Central Asia, you have women from literally all over the world. So that Victorian concept of those horrible Saracens are kidnapping white women and enslaving them. There's a kernel of truth in that there were white women in the palace as concubines. The Arab Muslim Persian group here is not going out kidnapping women. They're going to their local slave market and buying them. So whether their group lost a battle and they got captured and ended up here, whether their family sold them because they couldn't feed them, there's a whole variety of ways women end up in slave markets and they end up, some of them end up in the palace and they set fashion trends because they are entertainers. So they're being seen um, by kind of the governors, the military leaders, the other people who are coming to the palace. Um, and they're seeing being seen by those people's women if there's a big festival and the women are getting together they're seeing those fashions. So you have an enslaved group who is setting fashion trends, which is still something I'm wrapping my brain around because it's a very, slavery in this era is much more dynamic than I'm used to coming from an American background. Um, the caliphs themselves get less and less Arab as you go through time. One of the things that the Abbasids did that the Umayyads did not was they allowed intermarriage. This was a way to, this was a way to quell rebellions. If there's a section of your population that is getting real rebellious, my son will marry your daughter or vice versa. We're now allies. Those people now have a little more power, <laughs> which is not great for the Abbasids, but it quells that unrest. Um, there is no primogenitor here. This is not Europe by any stretch of the imagination. Any of the Caliph's children can be named as the heir. 98 and a half percent of the time, it's a boy. There are one or two very notable exceptions to that. Um, so you can have an Arab Muslim father and one of the children from these concubines from anywhere else in the world. And then he has a kid with a concubine who becomes caliph. And then that goes on for several generations. So you have this place called Persia that's ruled by an Arab Islamic group who, and, and the people actually in charge end up being none of those things. <laughs> and those are people who are setting fashion trends for the Arab Islamic population, the Persian population, and that mix of Arab Persian populations. Um, so really digging into the context of, okay, where's that fashion trend coming from? Well, some of them are coming from the slaves that are coming from all over the world. Some of them are coming from the caliphs who are being raised by mothers from all over the world. So it's an Arab, Islamic, Persian area. That's not necessarily the people setting the fashion trends. So some do's and don'ts of fashion. Most of this information comes from court historians and biographical dictionaries. This is like reading Vogue or the red carpet or any of that. Who wore it best? Who made a major fashion faux pas? Who got ridiculed and for how long for doing this thing wrong? 
there were lots and lots of rules of what was appropriate for your station, for the activity you're doing, for the audience you're going to be seen by. So what's considered fashionable is a gradual, <clears throat> excuse me, a gradual range of colors. So lots and lots of colors are available, literally all of them, depending on how much money you have to spend. But instead of clashing lots of different colors together, they did a whole range of yellow, a whole range of red, a whole range of blue. Um, for state business, black is the official color. This includes anything from a legal court session to riding into battle. And this is particularly for men. Um, most of the time, they cared much more about what men were wearing than what women were wearing. There's a hadith, which is a it's not a law, it's a prohibition, supposedly said by the prophet. Lots of them got written down long after he was dead. So unlikely he actually said them. Um, but there is a hadith against wearing silk in an area that traditionally loves silk. That comes and goes depending on who's in charge and what time period you're looking at. But it very strictly applies to men. They did not care what the women wore, mm. mainly because women were seen in public less upper class women were seen in public class. Lower class women still had to work and nobody cared what they wore. They had much less choice in what they wore. They wore what they could afford. Um, for women, black, navy, dark blue, these are colors of mourning. Yellow is a controversial color. I wear a lot of it. Um, some sources say this is reserved for non-Muslims. Some sources say this is reserved to indicate Jewishness. The Cairo Geniza disproves that. Um, if you're not familiar, a Geniza is a repository. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the informal version of that is, is it's a trash heap. It's, it's where the Jewish community disposed of written documents. Initially, the concept was related to uh, related to the temple, the synagogue, these were religious documents, and they had to be disposed of appropriately to be respectful of the religious content, because the written word was very powerful. The Cairo Geniza eventually came to be the community repository for disposing of written documents, so we get all kinds of records in there. It's, it contains centuries of, of records from the Jewish community and not. <laughs> it's, it's a fantastic resource. It's controversial as to how some of that information came out of that community. A lot of it was stolen, but it is a fantastic resource that we do actually have some access to now. Um, and it proves that Jewish women wore whatever they wanted. Um, again, that may be within their homes that may be because this was in Cairo, so it's further away from where those laws were being enforced. I don't know for sure, um, but their trousseau lists show they wore literally everything. Um, there are references that men who wore yellow into battle were made fun of. You're supposed to wear black. You're going into battle on behalf of the Abbasids and the color of state here is black. If you do anything else, that's wrong. Um, and, and literally that guy got made fun of for like a year. Um, so wearing the right thing is a big deal. Um, red is a color of mirth and joy and celebration, but it's also the color of prostitutes. I don't have any more detailed information on which shades were writ or which, <laughs> uh, that is something I am definitely still looking for. Um, so your clothing can be very informative, not just about who you are, but about what activity you're getting ready to do. Um, do's and don'ts. They say, do not wear soiled clothing with clothing that has been washed. Well, that makes sense. Um, don't be the stinky guy. Do not wear clothing that has been washed with new garments. So if you're going to wear something new, you're going to wear a whole new outfit. They also say, do not wear linen with cotton. Okay, this went away at some point, or maybe just for some sections of the population, because Mulhem is a thing and there are a variety of fabrics that are mixed linen with cotton that are mixed silk and other things as well. So whenever you see something that says, don't do this, or this was against the law, they don't make a law unless people were actually doing the thing. So to get an idea of 
how much people were doing the thing and if that actually stopped with the law you kind of have to go to court records and look at whether or not that law was being enforced all that law tells you is that the people in charge usually your religious elite don't want people to do it it doesn't mean people weren't doing the thing um it also says don't wear cotton with kuhi i don't know what kuhi is the only description i found for it is that it's a material used for linings and I have a lot of descriptions like that, where it's like, well, I have a name and a very vague reference to what this could be. Um, the other general guideline was that fashionable people of the upper class wore materials that had something in common. Whether that's the gradual range of color or the materials, I don't know. So, Majlis al-Sharab. This is a drinking party, yes. A Muslim society drank. There are as many denominations of Islam, even in the 8th century, as there are of any religion you can think of today. I know of six that were active in Persia in the 8th to 10th centuries, and that's just the ones I've come across <laughs> in my reading, which means English language sources that are open access. Um, you were supposed to wear specific things to these drinking parties. And the outfit is called Thiab al Mundama. And that includes a fine gilala. We'll get into what that term is here in just a bit. And that is your underwear. Uh, a bright mula'a. I don't know what that is. That's the only time I've seen that word is describing the outfit for a drinking party. And the only description is that it may have been made of two pieces of cloth instead of one, and it's usually yellow in color. Hey. There were prohibitions about who could wear yellow and who couldn't just a minute ago. But for this, one of your first layers of clothing is supposed to be yellow. So again, who made the law? Where was it being enforced? Was it actually being enforced? Well, fashionable people going to these big drinking parties wore yellow. <laughs> um, a kamis of silk, that's one of your outer layers. Um, and this one is supposed to be silk, but it could be any color. If you wore other things to this drinking party, you're considered disreputable. And you're never ever going to wear your work clothes to this party. They were very big on the appropriate clothes for the appropriate actions. You would never show up to court to have a petition heard wearing this outfit, and you would never show up to this drinking party where you are schmoozing with all of the high and mighty people wearing the outfit you wore for business. So, kila, um, that KH or that GH could also be pronounced with a H noise. I'm just not very good at it. <laughs> but culturally, that is a thing that happens with these languages. So, kila or kilat are robes of honor. This is a gift from typically the caliph or perhaps a governor or military leader on the, on the caliph's behalf as an investiture of you being appointed to a position as a reward for awesome service as, hey, the dude likes you and is showing you a favor very publicly. Language rabbit holes. Not every time clothing is gifted is it actually a robe of honor. Also, not every kila, not every robe of honor is actually clothing. Sometimes it's a horse. So robes of honor, when they are clothing, have an inscription on them. This usually includes a blessing, the name of the caliph, the name of the gifter, if it's not the caliph himself, the date it was made, and the city where it was made. Na the name of the city where it's made is a big deal on a lot of clothing. It's kind of like a brand name. So if you have a coat, and it's referred to as a coat of a particular city, that means that's you bragging. That city is really well known for this type of silk, and I have a coat from there. So that is, that is a big deal in a lot of clothing names, is naming the city where the fabric came from. In the ninth century, the kila were frequently given to state officials, to emissaries, to governors, to your civil servants, to your bureaucrats. In the 10th century, we see that shift and it's mostly military officials who are receiving robes of honor. That tells you a little bit about what's going on <laughs> in those time periods. Um, there is extant evidence of inscriptions on clothing until 1037 in Baghdad. Text sources actually continue referring to this practice throughout the Seljuks reign, which um, goes on up through 1057. 
uh, the Seljuks continue beyond that, not always specifically in Baghdad, <laughs> um, but that is that is where our text sources kind of leave us off with that. So this is um, a written summary of an extensive gift of robes of honor to somebody. So he got a black outer robe. A lot of these are going to be, at least the outer robe is going to be black because it's part of your investiture, it's your recognition by the government. So you are receiving your work uniform. So a black outer robe, a robe of a single color, having a collar and a lining, and then a similar robe without a collar. I don't know yet if the collar is talking about kind of a contrasting face thing or if it's actually like a standing collar. I've not yet seen extants with a collar, like a standing collar, um, but I don't have a lot of extants from this period. This is also before Persian miniatures paintings were a big deal by several centuries. So I have some carvings usually of guys on horseback in battle or in hunting, and I have itty bitty people painted on ceramics. It's really hard to tell what's going on in detail. Um, a red cause silk, that cause is a type of silk, of sus, which is a place, so they gave him some fancy red silk. Gold figured silk of mulam. Mulam is a mixed fiber. Um, so it's a gold figure silk that is a mixed fiber. And one colored stuff of Kaj. Stuff gets used to refer to fabric a lot. <laughs> um, a Dabiki Kaba, which means that's the brand name. So Kaba is a coat. Dabiki is where this one was made. So it's a very fashionable city to own fabric from. Part of his robes of honor is also a, a sword with a red sheath studded with silver, mounts with saddles. And those who distinguish themselves in battle also received a collar, two bracelets, a sword, and a girdle. Um, girdle here, mintak is, is usually meaning like one of those plaque belts as, repo, as opposed to uh, the big fabric sash that just wrapped around you. There's a different word for that one. Um, the collar and bracelets were studded with jewels. So he's getting a whole full outfit and horses and sword and saddles and lots and lots of jewels. Um, so in the early Abbasid era, you get three different price ranges for robes of honor. You tend to see 300 dinars. Dinars are um, are the gold coins as opposed to dirhams, which are the silver. Uh, 100 dinars or 30 dinars. So you get a range of how much your kila would be worth. And kila could be a whole set of things, or it could be a single garment, or it could include horses and swords. Um, they also sometimes, as opposed to robes of honor, get referred to as the seven robes. So if you're reading something and the caliph bestowed upon him the seven robes of whatever, those are robes of honor. Um, there's not always seven of them. They're not always clothing. Not every time he gives someone clothing is it part of this specific practice. So figuring out the language that's being used and what they're actually intending to say is, is a trick. <laughs> there's a lot of cultural context that happens to it. So Taraz, this is in the SCA, we use this word as shorthand for a band uh, of inscription, usually around the upper arm of a garment. And to be fair, on a lot of extant garments from later period, that is where you see this. This word gets used way, way, way before this. I mean, going back well before any of the Arab Muslim groups came in and took over. Persia used a similar term, usually meaning embroidery. Later on, this came to mean an inscription of any kind. It could be embroidery or not. It didn't have to be on the upper arm of a garment. It could be anywhere on the garment. So those slave women embroidering poetry on their clothing, hey, that got called Taraz. Totally different thing than what we think about for Taraz. Could be just a garment with an inscription on it anywhere. Um, could be the factory where those garments are made. So there are several buildings in the Caliphal Palace referred to Dar al-Taraz. Those are factories where fabric is made. Those are factories where inscri inscribed fabric is made. Um, sometimes it's the factory that makes 
the things that are given out as robes of honor. It doesn't even have to be clothing. <laughs> so the word gets used everywhere. It gets used eventually in common language as anything that is of good quality or a very fine item. Um, this big quote from the Encyclopedia of Islam gets quoted all over the place. Anyone who talks about Taraz tends to quote this. And they actually attribute it to R.B. Sargent, who is another author that writes about um, fabric in these cultures a lot and clothing in these cultures a lot. And when everyone kept saying the same thing in the same way, I went, okay, they're clearly quoting someone. So I went and looked at the footnote and it took me back to R.B. Sargent. I've read some of his articles and I'd never seen this. So I went back to where they said they were getting it from. I found the book it's in. I read it. He does quote this. He's quoting the Encyclopedia of Islam, and then he goes on to explain how he disagrees with this. I was like, dude, that guy's got to be pissed. <laughs> um, everybody is quoting him as having said this thing that he disagrees with. So if you see modern scholars all saying the same thing in the same way, trace it back to the origin. You may not agree with their interpretation of what was said. Um, the author may not agree with their interpretation of what was being said. Um, so he attributes this to the Encyclopedia of Islam, and he said, it's a theory, it's not a bad theory, but there's no more real evidence for it than there is for any of the other theories he's heard, which is essentially that Byzantine Coptic factories in Egypt prior to Islam were using this term for embroidery and for inscriptions on fabric. Um, this was also the term used by the Persians for the factory system under the Sasanian kings. Um, the Sasanians are the last indigenous Persian rulers of this area before the Arab Islamic groups came in. So we have two or three other places where we find this word being used before Islam in Persia, outside of Persia, the origins are really confusing. Everyone keeps quoting this big paragraph the guy they attribute it to disagrees with that being as being as an agreed upon thing. <laughs> so it's iffy. It means lots of things. Look at the context and try and actually trace it back to where they got that information from. And just know that the way we use it in the SCA is not the way the culture would have understood that. What we do actually know about Taraz is that the Umayyads and the Abbasid courts needed huge quantities of textiles. And the way we reasoned into kind of the quantity of textiles needed is the workshops called Dar al-Taraz. There were at least two at any given time. You have Dar al-Taraz, you have Dar al-Katun, and Dar al-Khaz, House of Taraz, House of Cotton, House of Silk. So if House of Cotton is making cotton fabrics and House of Silk is making silk fabrics, what is Dar al-Taraz making? I have no idea something that was being given out, probably inscribed, possibly fabric. And I don't know for sure if Dar al Taraz was manufacturing them and the other two were warehouses that were storing them. And that's how they divided them up and named them. I'm still digging. I only have so much time to read at any given point. <laughs> um, Taraz appears in the writings of Hassan ibn Tabit, who's an Arab poet from 6th and 7th century. So we have it way back before um, Islam came to Persia. So Arabs knew about this word, even though it supposedly comes from a Persian word. Ibn Khaldun claims it was a Persian term. He's writing in the 14th century and other contemporary authors disagreed with him. So if that's where people are pulling the idea that it came from a Persian word, Eh, even the people at the time thought he was full of it. Um, Taraz and gifting inscribed things like this was the Caliph's privilege. This was propaganda in a big way. It's the same way of, um, it's the equivalent of being able to mint your own coins and have your face and your name on them. It legitimizes his reign and it spreads his, um, it spreads his word fame, it spreads his likeness, it spreads his wealth, his power, his generosity to everyone who gets these. So even if a governor gave it to some functionary way outside the capital, it's still gonna include the Caliph's name because being able to gift that 
comes from the power that that governor got from the caliph. So it spreads his propaganda. Um, there were early manufacture centers in Egypt, then in Bishapur, which is in Iran, and then in Baghdad. Um, so you get all of these different centers that manufacture. Stuff manufactured in Egypt didn't necessarily stay in Egypt. It went to Anatolia, um, Byzantium. It went to Baghdad. It went to a variety of places, depending on who they were allied with, who was paying for stuff, and who was in control there. All right, we are going to switch over to clothing terms. Shi'ar and Dithar. Shi'ar is your underwear. It's the garments you wear right up against your body. And Dithar is anything you wear over that. Those are kind of categories of clothes. So Gilala, Hilala, Lala is usually a, this is your top. It's a chemise of linen or cotton worn next to the body underneath your other layers. So this is a body shirt or a dress. And I found at least three variations of this garment. One is a garment that wet men wore beneath a coat of mail and it was usually quilted. So it's actually like a gambeson. The others are worn by both men and women. All classes of society wear these. There is a summer version that is light and nearly transparent and a lined or quilted version for cold weather. It is considered appropriate wear for your private apartments to just wear your underwear. If you go out into the family space of your house, you're gonna put something over this. But if you're just kind of hanging out in your room, eh, wear your underwear. Um, atab is a, women, a woman's shirt with a slit at the neckline. Um, so sometimes we get things referred to as a gilala. Sometimes we get them referred to as an atab. I don't know if an atab was underwear or not. I don't have extants of underwear from this period. So it's one of those things where I'm going, okay, these, these are the words we get and the basic descriptions I have of them. Because I live in the Midwest and it gets over a hundred in the summer when we do a lot of our camping, I don't wear all of the layers. My outer dress and my underdress are basically the same thing. I wear one layer. So essentially I wear a gilala that is colored <laughs> instead of a gilala and then another dress. Reasonably, I would have an extra layer underneath if I was doing all of the layers. Um, tubin is pants or shorts. Typically, tubin is taken to mean knee length or shorter that you wear beneath your gilala. Frequently, men wore these, as far as I can tell. Um, and it's referred to as being very common among upper class men on hunting trips because it's um, easier to move in. But it would be highly unusual for anyone not on intimate terms with you to see the tubin of an upper class person. In later period, you see them in paintings on lower class workers all the time. So one of the schools of, of art from later period includes, here's the palace and the people in it doing their thing and here are the lower class people on the outside doing their things. And you'll see bath attendants and fishmongers and sailors and dock workers. You'll see these men just in shorts. That's the tuban. You'll see women with their skirts tucked up into their belt and you'll see these shorts on that's what we're talking about here. I don't know if in later period they use the same word for it, but the description fits with this word. So I'm taking the idea of that image that I've seen in later period paintings and putting it with this word for this time period because I don't have images that show underclothing for this time period and I don't have extants of them. Charval, Sirval, however you want to say the word. This is a sewn garment for your lower body. These are long pants. Nearly all Middle Eastern personas are going to use this word to mean a garment for your lower body, but they're not always describing the same style. This word goes back to at least 600. There's some arguments that it could go back earlier. It is still used today in Middle Eastern countries to mean pants but the styles included under that word are drastically different from one another. So basically all I know 
for Abbasid Persia is that upper class women's pants were typically wider than men's. That's that's typical because of the activities you were expected to do or not do. Um, this can mean literally anything depending on the time and place where you find the word. It can mean shorts. It can be tight tapered pants. It can mean those big MC Hammer pants. Um, you get a huge variety in the style being described. So that cultural context of who is saying this word will um, will determine who's actually like what style they're actually describing. Um, so yeah, if you see a word and you go, hey, that's familiar, don't run with whatever image popped into your head, look at the context around it. Kamis is the first of our outerwear. This is a linen shirt with a rounded neckline and it's worn by men and women. Um, Mubatan Kamis is a winter version, so it's lined and it's usually heavier fabric. So for the Umayyad period, Kamis was full length, long or short sleeves, and it was slid down the front. In the Abbasid era, Kamis meant a tunic you pulled over your head. There's no front opening. You had long wide sleeves and the length was mid thigh to mid calf. So same word, different garment. Because I would not consider a tunic you pull over your head and something that's open down the front to be the same thing. Um, same thing on short sleeves or long sleeves. Um, it was thought excessive for any garment to cover your heels, particularly for men. Um, you get into a lot of argument and discord between the religious elite who are champion championing pi um, piety and modesty and moderation and you're very wealthy people interested in fashion <laughs> so this this rule about hey garments covering your heels is excessive is coming from that religious elite and that usually means people were doing the thing at least for some period of time so wide sleeves indicated affluence and status for the abbasids narrow sleeves was either a lack of affluence or a very intentional show of miserliness or piety and modesty you were showing off. Um, wide sleeves were used like pockets. You carried documents, you carried money. Some people carried shears and slates and tablets, ink pots, scrolls, anything you could fit in those sleeves got carried in them. I still don't know how they kept them in there, aside from crossing your arms in front of you, essentially. Um, so uh, people who worked as secretaries or students or professors frequently used their sleeves to blot ink from paper, which just astounds me with how expensive fabric was at this time, but it was a common practice. So you would, you would recognize a man of letters, a man who worked with writing from his sleeves because they would be stained with ink. That was a common thing that got said. They, your sleeves are also used as a kerchief to wipe and clean your face. And at times women use their sleeves to cover their face if they are talking to someone in front of whom they should be veiled. I do not cover veiling in this class. I'm trying to put together a class just on veiling because it is a huge topic. It is a very fluid thing. Not all women veiled and even women who did veil, it was a fluid thing. It really depended on when, where, and who you're talking to. Um, so at times, literally just holding your sleeve in front of your face to pass a message on and then turn away from that person is enough. Sometimes you have to be fully wrapped up in a separate garment. Um, as the uh, Abbasid's power declined, the sleeve width and turban size increased for men and it became a very ironic thing. So the why at that point, looking at late 10th century and, and on, it was frequently said that you can, um, tell a man's desperation or ruin by the size of his sleeves. So if you were showing off too much, it meant you were compensating. Kaaba is um, the cross front coat like I'm wearing that would actually be called a Kaaba in this time period. Other times and places use the word Kaaba, Kaaba, they mean a different style. Um, this is a long sleeved close fitting coat with buttons. In the Abbasid era, it reached from mid thigh to mid calf Men usually wore the shorter version, women wore the longer version. It is divided down the front and then overlapped at the chest. That overlap is a Central Asian influence in Persian dress. Uh, 
Kaaba was typical for the viziers, for your government employees, your bureaucrats. The men who were in those positions were required to wear black when conducting official business. Any other time you could wear whatever colors you wanted. You would receive Kaaba as part of your investiture in a position along with a sword and a belt adorned in gold. So your robes of honor would include this. Um, Any one of rank appearing in the court before the caliph would wear a Kaaba. Uh, the Kaaba and belt were also typical dress for young boys in the upper class, and it's initially started as a military thing. Um, but eventually young men in the upper class were no longer serving in the military, but the fashion continued on. Dura'a is another outer garment. This is another coat. I do not know if you would layer these two outer garments or if you would just wear one or the other. I haven't gotten that detail yet. This is an outer garment with sleeves, slit down the front, closed with buttons and loops. It's made of wool. It's usually thickly embroidered. Colors vary. It could be brocaded. It could be bejeweled. Um, caliphs used their dura for personal and ceremonial occasions. It is used as part of the robes of honor. It was a way to recognize and show favor to members of the court and the military. In the mid 9th century, this was obligatory for everyone except the Qadis who wanted an audience with the Caliph. Qadis are, are judges, they're magistrates, they conduct court business, legal court as opposed to royal court. Um, so they would be wearing a black Kaaba as opposed to a Dura. Um, but kind of like you don't get into the fancy restaurant without your dinner jacket, you won't be heard by the Caliph if you're not dressed appropriately. Um, 10th century officials in Western Persia wore the Dura. -a, and it was considered a sign of wealth and prestige to be in a position to wear them. Juba. This is another outer garment. Same thing. I don't know if you layered these or not. I would assume when it's cold that you would layer at least some of them. Uh, it's an outer garment worn in place of the dura. -a. And it's worn as an option by those who are not holding official positions. It has a um open front wide long sleeves and it's a long garment caliphs use silk for their juba woven with gold thread and to give you a concept of the wealth happening here frequently caliphs would wear a garment once and either give it away or send it to be made into something else essentially to be recycled but they frequently would wear an item once and then gift it they would literally give you the coat they had been wearing but it's not really their coat. They put it on for that ceremony. So the symbolism there is that they're giving you their coat. That's not really what's happening. Abba is outerwear common in both pre-Islamic and Islamic eras. It is short, so I'm assuming mid-thigh or shorter, and open in the front and sleeveless. So we have a short sleeveless garment, which is not something I'd heard of before for this um, region. It was often made of coarse wool in a variety of colors. A thin one is worn in the summer. A lined or quilted one was typical in winter. And it became very popular in urban areas. And as it became more popular among wealthier people, you would get away from wool. You would get into um, fine linens, fine cottons, and even silks. And then if you were wearing one of wool, that would be a sign of poverty. In Baghdad, women typically did not wear this. They would wear an Izar rather than an Abba. And we'll get into the Izar in a minute. So Izar and Mizar, Mizar, I'm not sure about pronunciation on that. I read most of these words. I don't fluently speak Arabic by any standard. Um, these are outer wraps. These are some Arabic garments that made their way into Persian culture. So these are big rectangles of fabric and I have, goodness, I, I stopped including things after a certain point that were just described as a rectangle of fabric. I have no idea how they were worn, <laughs> what they actually looked like when they were wrapped. Um, so pre seventh century in Saudi Arabia, this was an unsewn close fitting garment wrapped around the waist covering from the navel to the mid calf. So it was a lower garment. By the Abbasid era in Baghdad, this is an outer wrap used by both men and women. And sometimes women would cover their heads with it and they would actually stitch it to a headband with silk thread. I don't know if that was 
like a permanent fixture. I mean, it sounds that way, but you know, I've pinned my veil to my hat. I can change out my veil real easy. This was more like, okay, we've made this one piece. So if I want to wear a different one, I'm going to have a whole different headband that a different thing is attached to. Um, Mizar is described as a small Izar. I don't have references to size for what that actually means. In Arabic culture before coming to Persia, Mizar was a loincloth. So it was a small triangle, rectangle of cloth. In the Abbasid era, it refers to a head covering. And it, wearing a kamis without a Mizar was considered uncultured. And even in areas of hot climate, men would typically wear both of these. So I don't know if in when the Abbasids came to Persia, Persian people were wearing something that the Arabs looked at and went, hey, that shape reminds me of loincloths. Or if somebody got drunk at a party and took their underwear off and put it on their head, I don't know. I don't know how you got from loincloth to a headpiece, but that is the trajectory we're on. Rita is originally a cowl and then became a head covering or a mantle for men of honor. In the Abbasid era, this is a cloak that you wear over your shoulders over a kamis. So instead of wearing three or four layers of coats, you have your underwear, you have your first layer shirt for men, dress for women, and then you have a cloak. Um, could also be pulled up over the head for protection against the weather, and in some cases it's described as a hood. So whether it's a full cloak with a hood or just a hood, I'm unclear. I don't know if those are two different things, if they're one garment, if it's one word used for both styles. Um, for women, this could be used in place of a veil. So you could have a cloak or a hood that you then pulled up around your face. Um, both Umayyads and Abbasids use this and they used it all year. Um, Ritas could be patterned, fabric, or embroidered. Frequently they were embroidered with circles, like eyes, and adorned with taraz at the border. So again, there's some sort of inscription it's not on the upper sleeve of a garment. <laughs> um, they may also be lined with sable or mink. Lining with fur was a huge deal on winter garments. Your boots have them, your coats have them, your mantles have them. Um, here are a bunch more names of rectangles of fabric. I don't have descriptions as to how they were worn, so we're going to go ahead and skip these for time's sake because I think we're at the point where I need to start answering questions. Um, yeah, you yeah. just yep. almost hitting your five minute mark. Just there. yep. Okay, so jarab or jarab and ron are socks and then leggings. Um, usually these are felt and they're used to carry stuff. Um, the socks would be worn indoors, so you'd come up to the house, you take your leather outer boots off, and you'd essentially have felt boot inserts that you still wore around the house. Ron are leggings. This is essentially cloth. They say it's made exactly like a boot, just without the foot. So you wore leggings, and then they stuff them with cotton um, in the winter to help. So I'm assuming you have a tighter pair and a looser pair, so you could stuff them when you get cold, and then you put those in your boots. Um, we got three or four words for boots and sandals, and then I think that's the end of it. So we'll go ahead and open up for questions.